Thanks. All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And welcome to this, this great panel on this beautiful day in Washington, D.C. I want to first of all just thank all of you for being here today. I want to congratulate all of you who have taken time to travel from all over this great country to be here for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's annual legislative conference. I hope that while you are here, you're not only participating in panels like this, but you're getting an opportunity to visit with members of Congress, uh, also on both sides of the aisle, as well as members of Congress who are not just our leaders in the Congressional Black Caucus. I hope you're using this money that you've spent to be here. Uh, you're using it well and smartly, because being here in Washington at this time in our nation's history, we need you to to talk to everybody who will listen about the issues that are important. Today we are talking about a very, very important issue and we would not have been able to have this discussion um, but for the sponsorship and the leadership of one of our members of the Black Caucus from the great state of Missouri. And so at this time it's my honor, I wanna to introduce to you the Congressman, our friend, Congressman William Lacey Clay. He is the St. Louis region <laughs> senior member of Congress and the Dean of Missouri's US House delegation. Congressman Clay was first elected to the House of Representatives in 2000, succeeding his father, the Honorable Bill Clay, who served for 32 years and was founding member of the Congressional Black Caucus. Congressman Clay is currently in his ninth term, and prior to his election, he served 17 years in both chambers of the Missouri legislature. The Congressman is a senior member of the powerful House Financial Services Committee, where he serves as the ranking member on the Subcommittee on Financial Institutions and Consumer Credit. The key subcommittee has, this key subcommittee has major oversight responsibilities over banks, credit unions, brokerage houses, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and credit rating agencies. Mr. Clay is also a senior member on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, which has major oversight and investigative responsibilities for the operations of the federal government. Now I wanna give the Congressman some credit here. We, when we watch television on CNN and CNBC and God forbid if you watch Fox News, you hear a lot about, you hear a lot about legislation that's not voted on or voted on and you very seldom hear about some of the great things that are actually passed in Congress. And so I wanna to talk to you about a success that Senator uh, Congressman Clay had recently. Congressman Clay recently introduced House Bill 3683, the African American Civil Rights Network, and it was passed this July in the House. His bill directs the Secretary of the Interior to identify and create a national network of historical sites, stories, research facilities, and educational programs connected to the modern African American Civil Rights Movement. This historic civil rights trails, the historic civil rights trails and programs that will grow from this act will honestly tell the full and sometimes painful story of the struggle for civil rights, not just for African Americans, but to foster healing, tolerance, and understanding among all Americans. And Congressman Clay got that piece of legislation passed this year in this current House of Representatives, and I think he deserves a round of applause. Congressman Clay is a champion for the First Amendment freedoms, and, and, and he remains a staunch advocate for the arts and the creative freedom, as I just mentioned. He is the proud father of Carol and Will, and he and his wife, Patricia, attend St. Nicholas Catholic Church. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor. Please join me in welcoming our friend, our Congressman, Congressman William Lacey Clay. Thank you so much. Thank you, John, and thank you for that kind introduction, and... Uh, I'm really, um, I, I want to catch my breath a minute. I was rushing to get here, and you know, you try to uh, time it for traffic, but DC traffic is another issue in itself. You know, in, a, in addition to Don being a great champion of civil rights and the empowerment of our people, uh, you're also an outstanding moderator, and thank you for being here again. I also want to thank our exceptional panelists uh, who will address the history of policing of black America from several perspectives, uh, including landmark moments along the long road we have traveled from emancipation to today, empirical evidence backed up by hard data from local and federal sources uh, and local law enforcement experts 
who can speak directly to how our communities are policed. And then together we're going to address a hard, ugly truth in America in 2017 in supposedly the greatest nation on earth. Some lives are still worth more than others. Um, our young people are outraged and angry about that, and so am I. I'm sure you have all been closely following another terrible case of police-involved killing of a black suspect in St. Louis, in my hometown. The acquittal of officer, a former police officer, Jason Stockley, who killed my constituent, Anthony Lamar Smith. Once again, an out of control police officer who has killed a young black man with no consequences. Justice has been cruelly denied for Anthony Lamar Smith, family, and my community. I stand in total solidarity with that community in expressing my absolute outrage at the verdict. Jason Stockley acted as judge, jury, and executioner. He violated multiple department regulations and he showed a total disregard for the life of Anthony Lamar Smith. The St. Louis Circuit Attorney's prosecution team, team did their best to prove him guilty of murder beyond a reasonable doubt, but the judge ruled otherwise. This case was pre-wired from the get-go. They knew this judge was retiring in December. They knew he would not face voters again. Uh, and, uh, and the defense team coordinated I allege coordinated with this judge to have a bench trial instead of facing a jury of 12. That's why I say it was pre-wired from the get-go to get an acquittal. Our communities need to trust the police and we want good law enforcement. We are not anti-police, but we want police officers to serve as community guardians, not as an occupying force that views the people in the neighborhoods they serve as their enemies. Today we hope to hear some concrete solutions about how to make things better for our children. We want law enforcement and the community to work hand in hand to have safer streets, and I'm committed to this effort as St. Louis has already seen too much of a loss in life and too much sadness. This tragic case also underscores the urgent fundamental question that our nation has failed to answer. How do we transform local law enforcement and our criminal justice system to finally provide equal justice under the law for all instead of for some. The federal legislation that I have already introduced could provide some of the answers because it would mandate increased sensitivity training for police officers to help them de-escalate potentially violent situations before they become <coughs> deadly. My bill also requires the appointment of an independent prosecutor in all instances when police use deadly force. And that's essential because you can't ask a local prosecutor to investigate the same police force that he or she works with on a daily basis. I've also co-sponsored legislation that incentivizes the use of body cameras by all local police departments who compete for Justice Department grants. 
These transformative changes would make a huge difference in bridging the trust deficit that still divides many police officers from the citizens they are sworn to serve and protect. So with that, let me thank you again for being here and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you all again to all the panelists and thank all of you for being here today. Don, thank you. All right, thank you Congressman Clay for your leadership and for putting this panel together. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Don Cravens, as the Congressman said, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Senior Vice President for Policy of the Nash for the National Urban League, and I also serve as the Executive Director of our National Urban League's Washington Bureau. And so it is an honor to be with you here today. The Congressman asked me to moderate this panel, but I must say he asked me to do so through his Chief of Staff, who also is my wife, and so I could, I had very little choice, and I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be here today. No, I'm, I'm honored to be here today, because this is an important issue. You know, as many of us have seen uh, Ava DuVernay's Emmy award-winning documentary, 13th, as well as read Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, we see these visual and liter literary works both offered a disturbing chronicle of national shame, the long history of racial inequality in the United States of America. Audiences were shocked to learn that our nation has produced the world's highest rate of incarceration. America represents just 5% of the world's population, yet we are home to nearly 25% of the world's prisoners. And a disproportionate majority of these prisoners are African American. The basic premise is that the 13th Amendment, while celebrated and guaranteeing emancipation for slaves, subsequently served as a loophole for ensuring that large segments of America's black population would be doomed to a lack of liberty. This panel seeks to explore the 13th Amendment and consider its relationship to policing, criminal justice, and mass incarceration among minority communities. I will provide some statistics today throughout the questioning to underscore uh, the urgency and the depth of the consequences of generational racial unequal treatment. But first, we have an extremely well-qualified panel here <coughs> this afternoon. Please know that today's panel is not solely about recognizing issues and pointing out problems, but as the Congressman says, we are here today to discuss strategies and to talk about solutions. So let's get started by introducing our panel, and I will provide you some information about all of them. And I'm going to start with my dear friend uh, to the far right, my far right, Ms. Tanya Clay House. She is the uh, principal, CE, COO and principal of Clay House Consulting Incorporated. She is the former Deputy Assistant Secretary for P-12 Education at the U.S. Department of Education. She was selected by TheRoot.com as one of the top 100 African Americans to watch for 2010 and was awarded the 2003 CBC Chairs Award for her dedication, leadership, commitment in advancing the cause of civil and human rights for all Americans. Mrs. House was recently awarded the 2017 Vince Monroe Townsend Jr. Civil Rights Award from the National Bar Association. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Tanya Clay House. Uh, seated to the left of Ms. House is Thaddeus Hoffmeister. Uh, Professor Hoffmeister teaches courses related to criminal law, technology, and the jury. He also directs the University of Dayton School of Law Criminal Law Clinic, where his students represent indigent defendants charged with criminal offenses. Prior to joining um, UDSL, Hoffmeister worked on Capitol Hill, clerked for a federal judge, and served in the military. Mr. Hoffmeister obtained a bachelor's from Morgan State University, a JD from Northeastern University School of Law, and an LLM, it's a doctorate of laws, from Georgetown University Law Center. He's admitted to practice in California, Washington, D.C., Indiana, and Ohio. I am proud to also say that he is an active member of the District of Columbia Army National Guard, where he is a major promotable, which means he will be lieutenant colonel soon. And I work for him because I'm a captain in his unit. <laughs> um, he was responsible for physical activities this Sunday afternoon. And as you can see, he's in great shape. And every night this week, as I've tried to get up in bed and had all these aches and pains, I've thought about you, Major Hoffmeister. So thank you. But please welcome Professor uh, Expert Thaddeus Hoffmeister to the panel. Next is Mr. Clarence Cox III. 
He serves as director of special projects in the office of the chief for the Fulton County Police Department and the former director of safety and security for Clayton County Public Schools and its first chief of the Clayton County School Police. He graduated from several law enforcement executive training programs. He is certified as a law enforcement instructor for the state of Georgia. And Mr. Cox is the president of the National Organization of Black <coughs> Law Enforcement Executives. Please welcome Mr. Clarence Cox. <laughs> Next to Mr. Cox is Mr. Philip Goff. He is the co-founder and president of the Center for Policing Equity and an expert in contemporary forms of racial bias and discrimination, as well as the intersections of race and gender. Dr. Goff serves as one of the four principal investigators for the CPE's National Justice Database, the first national database on racial disparities in police stops and use of force. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Goff. And then last but not least is Ms. Christina Swarns. She is the president and attorney in charge of the Office of Appellate Defender. O OAD is New York's oldest provider of appellate representation. Prior to joining OAD, Ms. Warrens served as the litigation director for the NAACP's Legal Defense and Educational Fund. While at LDF, Ms. Warrens served as lead counsel in some of this country's highest profile death penalty cases. She is one of a whole, uh, only a handful of black women to have argued before the United States Supreme Court. We are honored to have you. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Warrens. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you see we got a panel from all different sides, and we've got experts in all different lanes, and today we are here to read some, get some strategy, some education, and hopefully solve some problems. I want to first by start, start by discussing what I put on the board here, the 13th Amendment. It's short, and it reads as follows. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. The 13th Amendment was passed by Congress in, on January 31st, 1865, and ratified by the states on December 6th of 1865. So Ms. Warrens, I want to start with you. In the immediate aftermath of the ratification of this amendment, Take us back a little bit, give us a history lesson. What did it actually mean for, for black people, for, for freed slaves at that time? And how did the courts and the laws navigate for African Americans this newfound status where we went from property now to actual people? So thank you, thank you for the question. I think it's a really um, important to understand the history of the 13th Amendment and how it has and has not uh, functioned as many people expected it to and, and wanted it to. So as you noted, that the 13th Amendment was ratified in 1865, but I think a proper conversation about understanding the 13th Amendment requires us to go a little bit backwards. Uh, most of us think of the Emancipation Proclamation when we think about the end of slavery in this country. The Emancipation Proclamation happened two years before the ratification of the 13th Amendment. And the, the Emancipation Proclamation actually only affected the lives of the slaves in 11 states um, who were, uh, 11 Confederate states who were still fighting to secede from the Union. So the Emancipation Proclamation left slavery in place in the majority of the country. In the wake of the Emancipation Proclamation though, it was clear to the southern states, right, that the end of slavery was coming. Um, and, you know, options were available. They could have gone ahead and accepted that reality, but they did not. Before, again, before the ratification of the 13th Amendment, the southern states doubled down on slavery and implemented black codes, right, that stripped black people of their rights as citizens in this country, denied them access to the ballot, denied them access to the jury box, um, required them at force of essentially re-enslavement, right? If you had a work contract that you didn't complete, you would be put back essentially in a state of slavery until you worked off, quote unquote, that contract, vagrancy laws, right, allowed uh, police to pick black people up off the street and put them in jail to work, right, to put back into, a, into enslavement. Um, so in the wake of the Emancipation Proclamation, black codes came into force throughout the South to return black people to the state of slavery. So it was in this sort of moment of the black codes that the 13th Amendment is ratified, 
um, by uh, the United States Congress. And obviously that finally does, in fact, end chattel slavery in the United States and involuntary servitude. You know, this is the text of the first section of the 13th Amendment. And the interpretations of that over the years have been consistent and simple. It ended slavery, it ended involuntary servitude. The fun has begun in the second, in the interpretation, the discussion of the second clause of that amendment, which is that says <coughs> that Congress shall have the power to enforce this, this article by appropriate legislation, right? So how does Congress have the ability to make sure that no one is held in slavery, that no one is held in bondage? So the first thing Congress does is pass the Civil Rights Act of 1866 that, that strikes down the black codes. It declares that anyone born in this country is a citizen of this country, regardless of their race. Um, and so those kind of laws that, 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 that um, condition the rights of citizenship on race are therefore immediately declared unconstitutional. So that's the first thing Congress does, you know, to further this, this, this statement of um, there will be no slavery. They secondly then go on to um, announce the Anti-Peonage Act of 1867, right? We're not gonna have involuntary servitude. And then they announced the Civil Rights Act of 1875, and here's where we start getting into trouble. In 1875, they say, okay, black people now are not being allowed access to public accommodations. This is in the 1800s, right? We know this story from the 60s, but this was actually happening also in the, 18, the end of the uh, 1800s, right? And so Congress steps in and announces the Civil Rights Act of 1875 and says, no, 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 you cannot do that. This case, there's a challenge to the Civil Rights Act of 1875 that goes to the United States Supreme Court in, in a series of infamous cases called the Civil Rights Cases. And the United States Supreme Court declares that piece of legislation unconstitutional. And this is important because this ultimately becomes meaningfully the end of significant 13th Amendment litigation for almost 100 years. The Supreme Court in the civil rights cases says, well, no, 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 you got carried away with your enforcement, your theory about what you can do, your enforcement authority, Congress. People being discriminated against in hotels and guest houses, that's private discrimination. That's not something, that's, that's the province of you know, the 14th Amendment if there's state action, but this is not about slavery. Um, and this is when the phrase that we all know comes into parlance, right? the dis discrimination against people, they say, in public accommodations is not, quote, a badge or incident of slavery. They actually say, and I'll quote them because I think the language is, is um, interesting and it will be something I can imagine hearing today. What they say is, quote, it would be running the slavery argument into the ground to make it apply to every act of discrimination which a person may see fit to make to a guest, right? They say, oh, this is just regular discrimination that has nothing to do with slavery, notwithstanding the fact that that kind of discrimination, that kind of subjugation of people was exactly what, you know, was part of the system of slavery, right? So this is really a disingenuous distinction that the Supreme Court makes about how African Americans and how black people are discriminated against in this country. And it says, well, if there's state action, if it's a police officer, the 14th Amendment will resolve that. But the 13th Amendment cannot be used to address that kind of problem because it does not flow from slavery. And this really ends the conversation about the, 14th, the 13th Amendment in constitutional litigation. And we all know what happened after that, right? 1875, it, it all goes downhill for us, right? We've got lynchings, we've got Jim Crow, right? You have a series of you know brutal and traumatic years um, where the badges and incidents of slavery, frankly, were used to exclude and oppress our community, the African-American community, throughout the country and in the Deep South. And the 13th Amendment is silent at that time. It doesn't come back until 1968 in a case where the Supreme Court does a complete about-face, and I think that's a function of the time, um, and says that in a case where a, a home, uh, a black couple tried to buy a, a house from a home seller and they refused because of race, the Supreme Court completely turns around and says, no, 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 you know, that is covered by the 13th Amendment. The, the Congress can, in fact, uh, act in that space. And so there's a complete about face, and then you have the Fair Housing Act, which is a product of the 13th Amendment, 
you know, the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act of 2000. That is also a 13th Amendment Act. And of course, the James Byrd and Matthew Shepard uh, Hate Crimes Prevention Act. Those are all pieces of legislation that are based on the 13th Amendment. So Thank that you. That is sort of the history. Thank you. That is a good starting ground for all of us. Thank you. I want to go now to uh, President Cox. Mr. Cox, talk to us a little bit about the history of policing African Americans in this country's history, and maybe spend some time and talk about what changed when, during the 70s and 80s when we saw that the drug culture began to permeate some of the communities in this country. Thank you, and thank you, Congressman, for having us here. Obviously, um, modern policing uh, is something that started with the old slave patrols um, having always uh, you know, having a diverse and, I guess, impact on our community in our countries. And uh, to not just take you way, way back, when we first started as black law enforcement officers, we were only allowed to patrol our people. And we were not allowed to wear the uniforms home or carry the weapons home. And we were segregated to a particular neighborhood, obviously our, our neighborhood. And we were humiliated then, as sometimes we are being humiliated now, when we see some of the things that are occurring in our communities. Um, and, and I share with people all the time, the incidents that we've seen in late years of tragedies in our community when our folks have lost lives sensitively, um, it hurts us because we're black and we're law enforcement. And while we're standing in the gap trying to do what we're supposed to do as the protectors of our communities, we have to make the tough decision because of the oath that we swore to God to uphold and for the communities or stand with our people and perhaps create a greater issue. So as you move into what's going on today, it's prevalent and more recognized and a lot of it is largely in part of, of these. Mm -hmm. I'll submit to you that abuse and uses of force didn't just start in the last 10 right. years. It didn't start in the 70s. This has happened ever since I started in 81 on the force. But now it's highlighted because it's recorded and documented in a way that it's never been before. I also submit to you that in these types of situations, um, we find ourselves on the wrong side uh, largely because we don't educate ourselves on the process. The process is skewed and the police is only a subculture of the greater criminal justice system which is in large part screwed up from the start, if you will. And if you think about our duties as law enforcement, particularly front, out, front line officers, we're charged with doing a whole lot of things that are not in our toolkit. You call 911, you anticipate us coming out there solving whatever problem you may or may not have. And the problems are growing in our community largely because of the emphasis that people tend to put on money and the value system. If you think about the uh, crack cocaine epidemic in the 80s, I spent the majority of my time as an undercover narcotics agent, and some of these abuses that we see in the communities, I experienced as an undercover narcotics agent because I couldn't blow my cover. So yes, I've had my head busted with a three-cell flashlight. Yes, I've been thrown out of the car onto the ground and strip searched on a major thoroughfare as an undercover narcotics agent. So I know what's going on in the community, and while I have done all I can, and I've put several police officers in jail because of these things. Our community has failed in that we don't show up and show out in a way that we should. And what I, what I mean by that is this starts at the local level. We don't show up at the polls and do the things that we need to do. We don't show up at the police station and demand to see the chief. We don't file complaints against these officers. You know, in every community, and if you're honest with yourselves, everybody in here probably knew of or know of a road cop, unfortunately. But in every community, in every 
profession, there's someone who's not doing it right and not doing it to the best interest of the community. Unfortunately, in law enforcement, we're the only profession that is vilified, if you will, for our actions, regardless of whether they're <coughs> right or wrong. And we are the worst at marketing what we do. If you think of all the media, the, the cop shows and, and the movies that come out, the cop is either dirty, he's an idiot, or he's just not, he's lazy. I mean, there's never any positive shows. If you think of most of the shows, the, the, the only one that I can relate to that may be close to what we do in real life is uh, Blue Bloods. But most of these shows that you watch, and that's the perception that our community gets on what we do. And it's not always favorable. And, and, and what, so I'll share this with you. Um, it, it, we change the narrative, unfortunately. We change it accidentally a lot of times. In, in St. Louis, when the riots just started about the acquittal, because we don't necessarily remember our history when Martin Luther King and others were doing nonviolent protests, we go out, we tear up a community, and the narrative is changed accidentally, not about the acquittal. The news media is no longer talking about the acquittal, acquittal congressman. They're talking about the riots. So now we've helped them to remove the real issue. So John Lewis said earlier today, it's, it's great to be disruptive. I agree with that. But there's a difference between being disruptive and being destructive. We tear up our own communities. We got to go beg the same folks that most of the time who have oppressed us beg them for money to rebuild our communities, and a lot of times the money is so out of reach, we can't rebuild our communities, and that's why we end up like Watts and other places like that. So I, I submit to you, we got a lot of work, but a lot of that work starts out there. Don't start with here. I mean, I've got some noble members in here, and we'll all tell you that we don't want to be sitting beside somebody who violates your rights or, or anybody's rights, look, whether you look like me or someone else. That's not what we signed up for. I swore to uphold the, the, the community's trust and values, and we cannot build any great trust with you or anyone else when, when our leaders are doing things like they're doing. This week, uh, Jeff Sessions removed the, uh, uh, the safeguards, if you will, uh, in the collaborative reform, he calls it. Uh, there's no more uh, consent decrees in, in departments. Over, Unfortunately, we have to have somebody to police us to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to do. And when that's removed, you're endorsing this, crime, this kind of behavior. When our president says it's okay to put somebody's head into a car while making an arrest, we spoke up about that because it wasn't funny and we're not laughing. It's not, you know... For me, I take this really serious. And when somebody, when I first came into the job, the guy said to me, if you want to be rich, find something else to do. Because if you're the police, you're the poorest paid and at least thought about. I believe that. So if you're taking this thing serious and you look about how we have evolved, nothing's really changed. It's just being highlighted now. Mr. Cox, you brought up you brought up the, the justice system. I want to ask Ms. Clayhouse and and, Ms. and Professor Hoffmeister. For decades after the war on crime began, the U.S. Be developed this prison industrial complex in which special interests guide our criminal justice policy behind closed doors. I would like each of you to take briefly talk to us about the consequences of our country's full embrace of this incarceration principle and how the vulnerable, like African American communities, are the most likely to fall into this industry. Why don't we start with you, Professor Hoffmeister? Oh, well, you could, you could speak a lot on the, uh, the prison industrial complex. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's several aspects to look at. The one thing that I think it starts with is you see in our society this overcriminalization. And, and, you, and you, at least from, uh, most people point to the 70s when the federal government decided to get into uh, drug enforcement. And so you saw the increased uh, penalties for those who were involved in. Um, uh, illegal drug activities. And, and so along with that, you saw this, this involvement, this need to criminalize things that in many ways were historically settled out of court. And, and as you can see, this overcriminalization where people were, uh, you would be amazed how many people have misdemeanor offenses. 
I mean, it, it would shock you to know that there are so many people who have misdemeanor offenses, and there's so many uh, collateral consequences uh, when you when you have these offenses. Uh, you know, there's employment, there's housing, there's federal aid. So this overcriminalization for some of the for some very minor offenses helps feed this what we call prison uh, industrial complex. But I think it starts with this idea that we're going to look at the symptoms as opposed to the causes. So when we see a problem, we're going to say, you know how we solve this problem? We're going to incarcerate people. That's how we're going to. Now, as a side note, it'll be interesting to see how they do with heroin, because now it's a whole different ballgame. But when, when they see a problem, we're going to criminalize, we're going to criminalize, we're going to criminalize our way to the answer. When, that's not the answer. Close to 90% of the people that are currently incarcerated are going to get out. All right? You're not going to lock people up. You're not going to. So when you, when you focus on the, um, the symptom instead of the cause, you, d you delve into this prison industrial complex. Now, imagine if we, instead of spending the money, to create prisons, to run prisons, we spend a lot of that money on social programs. All right? Now, that to me takes deeper thinking and, and, and it's sort of an evolved way of looking at the problem because we're going we're gonna to treat the cause. What are the, I'm not saying that this, that's going to solve all the crime, but many of the causes, I think if you focus, if we, if we as the, if the government spent more money on education, providing uh, daycare, uh, providing better health care, that many of the causes uh, for, the, for the crimes that occur could be nipped in the bud, but people don't want to spend the money. The government doesn't want to spend the money there. Instead, they want to be reactive and look at the end of the spectrum and, okay, a problem has arisen. How are we going to fix this problem? Well, let's just incarcerate this person. So you have this, this cycle going that I think if people spent more, in fact, you'd actually spend less money if you focused on the front end instead of the back end. But the, the, the reason this thing all kind of flows is because we as a country, in my view, made a mistake. There to me are certain government inherent responsibilities. Uh, Don Cravens mentioned we're in the military. I think that is a government responsibility. I think uh, incarceration, prisons, is a government responsibility. I don't think you should privatize that because I think they have, you, you, you have an inherent conflict. If you go to any state or any district, and you ask the mayor or the governor, say, do you want to get rid of these prisons? Uh, in a minute, they'll say, yes, if we can. If that's a CEO, what is the CEO going to say? Get rid of my prisons? No CEO worse than Saul is going to say, get rid of my prisons. They make money off them. If there's an incentive to keep prisons going. When you privatize a prison, just like if you were to privatize the military, there's an incentive to go to war. There's an incentive. They have no incentive to get rid of these prisons. It feeds their bottom line. And so if you have businesses, private industries running a prison, what are they going to do? What are they going to do when the numbers get down? What would you do? What would you do if you ran a business and your numbers started going down? You're going you're gonna to do something to get people in. So what do they do? Oh, let's lobby. Don't they, isn't that what isn't that what a business is doing? They're up here all the time lobbying. So they're gonna lobby. So if you were if you owned a business, what would you lobby? Oh, one thing you may want to lobby is let's do mandatory minimums. All right, let's have tougher sentencing laws. Because if you have that, you increase the number of those incarcerated. So in my view, this prison industrial complex is a it's a it's a vicious cycle. And um, uh, I, I think it starts with overcriminalization. There, there are far too many criminal laws. And many of these laws will target some of the, 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 the most minor behavior you can think of. Right? And then that gets people in a system and a cycle um, which they can't get out of because they're in a set of circumstances because of their upbringing, because of their environment. They have a difficult time escaping. And the people who are running this prison system, they have a perverse incentive to keep it full. They, they don't want their stock to go down. They don't want their prisons to empty. If, if you're in a private business, you don't want it to shut down. Now, if the government is running it, they have an incentive to, um, to, to not fill up these prisons. So to me, I think the prison industrial complex is a very complex operation, but uh, we, we, I think, can fix the problem. Ms. Clay, House, what do you say? So I, I want to take this in a slightly different direction to really touch upon a few things that I've already heard, which is not only about the, the, the cyclical effect of how it is that we are really re incarcerating people of color, but where it's starting. Um, I think, you know, where it's not unknown. We live in a racist society still. Uh, it was built on the back of, a, of the oppressed. 
And as Cynthia gave the overview of the, um, of the history of the 13th Amendment, um, if you note in there, except as a punishment for crime where, where uh, the party shall have, do, have been duly convicted. So the exception there is if you're placed in jail, therefore you have no rights afterwards. Um, now, how do you get placed there? Well, it starts early, in preschool. You have four-year-olds that are being suspended and expelled in preschool. So I'm taking it back to education and how we're creating the population from an early age that is going to be engaged in the juvenile justice and then criminal justice system. Yes, my background, you know, I recently came from the Department of Education um, and one of my charges was to oversee the, um, the strategy by which we were uh, dealing with the disproportionate impact of discipline policies upon our children in schools and working with the Department of Justice. And we went through a number of different avenues. And one of the things that I, I wanna, you know, I wanna give you a couple of statistics because I think it's very important to understand, particularly about this prison industrial complex. Total PK through 12 expenditures increased by 107% from 1979 to 1980 to 2012 and 2013, from about 258 billion to 534 billion while state and local correction expenditures increased by 324% from about 17 billion to about 71 billion. Now, the prison industrial complex starts early. They determine where they're gonna be creating these prisons looking at third grade, third graders in school. And how? Because our children are getting pushed out. And how is that? Because they're being over disciplined because they chewed gum and they didn't speak to the teacher correctly. Um, and because our children are being viewed at an early age as being criminals. And so if we're gonna talk about the mass incarceration, I think we've gotta also understand how this is being perpetuated and also ingrained within the, the psyche of children and of our community from the beginning as they move through life. And so then that goes to the capacity and the inability for those that are engaged in the noble profession of policing to then view our children and view um, our community in the light that in such that they are depicted as criminals at the early age of four. I have a four year old. I can only imagine the many things that he does at school that I don't appreciate because I see what he does at home. And, but he's four, they're expected to do that. But when a four-year-old black boy does that, it is viewed much differently than his colleague, Emmy, young white girl in Fairfax County, who has a fit. She's not thrown out, but he is. And so the statistics are there, and I can go through some more. I know that we have some more you know, conversation we wanna have. But um, you know, I think as we talk about kind of the the prison industrial complex, it's also the cradle to prison, because not just school to prison, it's cradle to prison pipeline that is then creating this entire complex that people are profiting from. And so it's in the benefit of those that are making the profit to maintain these types of policies within our schools, because this is a profit-based society. We are in a democracy, but we are still a capitalistic society. It is not a full democracy. There are, still bar there are still parameters by which we exist in this democracy. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, I, I, I urge us to think more broadly right. on this conversation about how we're creating this and how the 13th Amendment really impacts our lives um, from the cradle right. to adulthood. It's funny, Tony, you talk about the way people look at us as African Americans, as people of color. I have a son who attends school in Virginia, and when my wife and I go to Virginia to visit with him as a black father, and she probably doesn't even know this, but many of you in this room understand this. Men, when I'm driving to Virginia, I make sure, Major, that my military ID and my driver's license are accessible so that if I'm stopped by the police, the first thing I'm gonna show them 
here's my military ID, I'm a good one, mm -hmm. and my driver's license. You're one license. of those good ones. <laughs> and I want it to be accessible, and I'm gonna tell you, and I do it every time, and it's a, it's a, it's a burden, it's an obligation, it's I feel, as a black man, that, boy, I don't want no stuff, and I wanna make sure that we leave early enough to get there before it's dark, <laughs> and that I leave early enough there and I get back. And, and it's 2018, it's 17, 2018, and I shouldn't even have to be thinking that way, but I do. You're absolutely right. Hey, I'll, I'll give you one better. I just got pulled over yesterday, and, and don't ask why, but <laughs> point is, it was late coming from here, and I got pulled over, and but for the fact that I was dressed nicely, mm -hmm. um, and I was in Virginia heading into a, a grocery store that is more higher end, mm -hmm. I fear what may have happened, because I was in a lit area, a, a lit area. And the reason that the police officer actually was very kind, and I actually wanted to applaud him, but he said, you know what, because you were polite, I'm not gonna do anything extra to you. I'm gonna let you off, thank God. But my point is this, is that I've been pulled over before because driving a sports car. I was young, I shouldn't have jumped out, but I had a hoodie on, I had my athletic gear on because I was in college, the triath athlete, and I'm like, what's up? Heaven forbid I do that this day. But that is how we have to, the mentality that exists right now, I was, I was actually worried still yesterday mm -hmm. about what was gonna happen mm -hmm. because I was looking around, I was like, okay, are there other pe people around? But that is how we have to raise our children mm -hmm. and it's because the teachers are looking at our children in school right now. You talk about the lowest um, paid profession. I argue with that because I believe teachers are one of the lowest paid professions. Mm -hmm. We entrust our children with teachers 75% uh, of their time, mm -hmm. their day, yet we don't pay them enough. Well, I want to get to, to, to Doc Goff here. I want to, Doc, chime in, because we've, we've had a couple of issues come up, and I, I see you scribbling, so I know there's some things you want to talk about. And I want you to help us understand, if violent crime rates have gone down, why is the prison population continue to grow? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I think given the totality of what we've heard so far and that question, I think I have to back up. You gonna okay. let me back up? Please, back up yeah, go All ahead, right. you're the expert. Um, I know it's not Sunday, but I'm feeling that, I'm feeling that vibe. Um, <clears throat> we're in dangerous times right now. Yes, we are. And the danger exists on multiple levels. The first level is the obvious orange menace, right? Um, the one that threatens to take away our democracy, our ability <laughs> to, to be living in, 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 in consistent ways with our values of our founding documents, at least the values that we tell ourselves that they mean. But the level I wanna talk about right now in, answer, in response to that question, in response to what we've been hearing today, we're in danger of conflating two things that threaten our livelihood, threaten our ability to live, not just the American dream, but the ability to breathe our next breath. One is the most morally egregious part of a system that was always already set up to make us into less than human. And the other is what's doing the bulk of the work of locking us up. They are not the same thing. What is most morally egregious is not what's doing the bulk of the work. They're both awful. We need to speak about them both the same way, but let me give you an example. What is egregious about mass incarceration? There's so many things. I take, for instance, we arrest somebody for smoking weed on their front lawn, <clears throat> on their property, in their own house sometimes, right? And then we give them a felony charge for smoking weed. Low-level drug offenses, they're not violent, they're not bothering anybody. Well, what's gonna happen afterwards? They're gonna get hungry, sleepy, <laughs> right? We, this is not a problem that America says is outrageous. Why are we locking those people up? That's outrageous, we should do something about it. It must be epidemic in our criminal justice system. Low-level drug arrests are less than 5% of the 2.3 million people that we lock up in the United States. Mm. It's important that we pay attention to it because it shifts the narrative. But if we fix that 100%, we're not solving the problem. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. What else is egregious? We've got these mandatory minimums. We've got these longer sentences. What sense does it make to lock up somebody who's 17 for shoplifting for 20 years? Because it's their third time trying to grab that stick of gum to impress their girl. What sense does it make? And we know that in the 70s, and particularly in the 80s, part of Reaganomics was those longer sentences. It turns out that during the rise of mass incarceration, sentences for the people who actually were convicted went up by less than a year. Longer sentences are not what's causing the rise in mass incarceration. 
They're egregious. We should fight them. They're ridiculous. And yet, they're not what's contributing to those larger numbers. And I deal with immigration a lot. And immigration, I have to say, when you deal with immigration in particular, private prisons are a massive problem. Because private prisons are do they're running those detention facilities, and they are for profit, and so they also are lobbying for stricter immigration rules. But they're about 10% of the rest of that governance elsewhere. Private prisons are a small percentage of what we're dealing with. 2.3 million people incarcerated. About 200,000 in federal prison. The rest is state, and it's mostly for people considered violent. Here's why it's dangerous. Let's say we solve these low-hanging moral outrages, which will be an effective and a worthy life spent. Mm -hmm. Let's say we solve them. We now have 2.1 million people in state who we have just contributed to the narrative that they don't belong with the rest of us. I'm concerned. We live in dangerous times. So part of what I want to do in responding to the drop in violence, I want to say we have a job to do to tell better stories. It's not just about what's obviously morally egregious. It's also what's casually morally homicidal. These felony convictions for so-called violent crimes, that's almost two million people. The way we're defining violence, that's someone going in with a crowbar into a home where nobody was. Mm -hmm. Now, am I wanting to sit down at, at the table right next to that person? Maybe not. But do I believe that after they've paid their debt to society, they should come out and be fully uh, enfranchised human beings? Yes, I do. The state of Florida disagrees with me. Mm -hmm. And if we're not telling the right sets of stories, that individual doesn't have a rest of their livelihood. We live in dangerous times. Now I want to shift from the incarceration part to the policing part, because that's usually what people want to hear from me. I'm, I'm a professional nerd. Um, <clears throat> and my nerdness is all about the stuff that I do in policing. <laughs> so let me give you just a couple of bits on that, because I assume that everybody, you're here not just because you're interested, you're here because you know things. This is a, this is a, a group of people that is a, is a good community for these messages. So I want to make sure that I'm giving you stuff that you might not know about policing. Right, so the first line on policing, we know that the racial disparities are huge. They're astronomical. That's not as interesting as the question for why are they that big. We now know some things we didn't know before. If you talk to almost any law enforcement official in front of a camera, any chief in front of a camera, they'll tell you the reason why our numbers are so disproportionate, we go where the crime is and the crime is disproportionately in black neighborhoods. Anybody ever heard that before? Okay. Right? Say it with me, somebody told a lie one day. Okay? <clears throat> We're able now, with the National Justice Database, which is the first and the largest database of police behavior in the world, the bar is relatively low, but we're still proud. Um, <clears throat> with the National Justice Database, we can control for the crime in a neighborhood. Now scientifically, I can tell you reasons why that's not a smart thing to do, but for the narrative, I can control for crime. I can take neighborhood A and neighborhood B and say, now they've got equal amount of crime, but one neighborhood got all the black people. What do you think we find? Still disparities. Next thing they come around and say, I'll say well, you know what, we have to go where poverty is because poverty causes crime, right? So I said, wait, somebody told a lie one day. We can control for poverty too. So now I got neighborhood A, neighborhood B, same crime, same poverty rate. One's all black, one's all white. Guess what? We see disproportionate contact and disproportionate use of force. But you can't do that without the data. People will say, well, it's the black culture. It's the education. I can control for that too. Right? Give me a data point. I am a data nerd. I got you. It's in the model. It's baked in. <clears throat> We've got it figured out. So that race cannot be reduced. You can control for all those other narratives, and you cannot take race out of it. So what the data are telling us is that more policing is not better, and that compliance with the law always begins with trust in it and not fear of it. The data tell us that. There is no trade-off between liberty, dignity, fairness, and public safety. Anybody who tells you that, tell them whether they know it or not, they're being a liar that day. And I got one other data point I want to say, because I see you leaning into the mic. <laughs> the other piece that I hear when I, when I lived in and when I go to and when I work in communities that are most vulnerable to disproportionate and cruel police contact Vulnerable communities, and that's how we have to talk about them. When I go in there, I hear from parents and I hear from cops the same message. It's the kids doing dirt that are causing us all the problems. It's the kids doing dirt that are causing us all the problems. Because the highest time of arrest, the highest time of police contact, 
It's when school's in session. Here's a, here's a myth I didn't know. Because I would have thought, you know, a kid who gets involved in doing crimes at age 12, they're the ones going to have most contact with police later on. I would think that that would be true. And all of us in our heart of hearts, my guess is in the room, you'd be like, yeah, you know them badass kids. <laughs> right? Some of you have them badass kids. You don't want to let them out the house because you know what could happen. Right? Y'all give me that knowing look. Like, yes, you stop talking about my kid. I understand. <laughs> Turns out that's not true. And I was shocked. We, fought, we followed two different cohorts of kids for two years each, hundreds of kids. And the amount of crime they were doing when we started had nothing to do with the amount of contact they had with law enforcement. Nothing. Not a thing. I'll tell you what did happen, though. The amount of contact they had with law enforcement when we started predicted the amount of crime that they did. Contact with law enforcement at a young age causes crime. It causes criminality. And I can tell you, that was so stunning, that's why we had to do it again for another two years. But when you are at age 13, 14, 15, getting stopped on your way home, constantly, not arrested, not cited, just stopped, why would you choose to follow the rule? when you were following the rules and it didn't protect you. We live in a society that's lying to our children about who they are and what they need to do to be safe. And until we fix that, we're causing them to tell themselves stories about why they are the problem. We can do better than that. That's what I say about declining crime and increasing incarceration. Thank you. I wanna, um I want to talk about an article I recently read by uh, James Foreman, who, who released a book entitled Locking Up Our Own. And in the book, he asserts that we revisit mass incarceration, but we have to also look the, to the fact that many of our black leaders during the 80s and the 90s were responding to unprecedented, at least what they perceived to be violent crime, violent threats in our neighborhoods with crack cocaine. He believes, Mr. Foreman believes, that locking up violent dealers up was the response to calls from the community who were demanding safe streets. Now, my millennials don't know this movie, but we Gen Xers, we remember New Jack City, right? And you remember as you watched the movie, you didn't know if to cheer, you were cheering for Wesley Snipes or were you cheering for Mario Van Peoples, right? We were with the cops or we were with the drug, the drug guys? And so that's just an example of some of those, 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 those distorted values that have been creeping. So I want to play devil's advocate a little bit, Doc, and I want to, I want to where in African-American community, because we are dealing with a, a, videos and terrible things we're seeing from the police, but how do we have an honest conversation? When do we have an honest conversation about the fact that we do want our communities to be safe? There is crime occurring in our communities, too. How do we have an honest conversation where you talk about what is happening in our communities? I think it's a great question. And, uh, uh, James is a friend of mine. The book is wonderful. It got long listed for the National Book of the Year. Uh, a year. We want him to win. We want more folks to win. Um, I think that we have to understand that book and the arguments that it makes in the context that black leaders have always been saying more than one thing. We have never been about one thing. It's never just crime in the streets. It's always also safety of the babies. It's never just we need better payment. It's also that we need to be able to live where we want. It's never just better hospital. It's also better jobs. And during the increase of um, <clears throat> mass incarceration, during the, the times when we were passing different laws, black leaders were saying, help us keep our, our streets safe. Help us to get folks off of drugs. And also, stop killing us. They were doing it then, too. And so what we see through the lens of near history is what Liz Hinton calls a kind of selective hearing. Mm -hmm. They can only hear the thing that also demonizes. Because if I say that my brother sometimes makes bad decisions, but he's good in his heart, and you say, see, you talk bad about your brother, you are selectively hearing me. And that's unfortunately why we're living in dangerous times. If we tell the wrong story, or if we allow ourselves to have that story truncated, told just half of it, then we will now be talking about only the good ones get out. That's part of the reason why younger people are so fed up with the politics of respectability. They say, if I'm good or I'm bad, it doesn't mean I'm not human, right? I'm no better or worse than the last couple of white presidents, right? In terms of my drug use, in terms of my, my GPA. <clears throat> and yet, I gotta be one of the best ones because if I'm not a straight A, if I'm not Harvard all the way from the time that I'm 10, then I'm a criminal and I'm a thug. If I sag my jeans once because I went to a concert, 
right? <clears throat> then I'm the problem. There's hundreds of municipalities that have uh, ordinances against SAG jeans. Most of them have no black people living there whatsoever. <laughs> right? That's the same folks passing things against Sharia law, right? Never met anybody Muslim, but they think Sharia is coming for them. Um, <clears throat> so I think the way to think about, so I, I didn't mean to rhyme, I'm from Philadelphia, I'm gonna break out in bars in just a second. Um, <clears throat> I think the way to think about having the honest conversation is it's always both and. And sometimes we get seduced by the idea that we have to tell ourselves the hard truths, that the easy truths don't come with it. Which is that, yes, we have problems with folks not wanting to cooperate with law enforcement in our communities. That's because law enforcement hasn't earned their trust. You can say both in the same breath. Right? It doesn't have to be either or just because white lenses have never been able to hear our whole truth. We can still insist on it. Tanya, I know you have to leave. Why don't we, before you leave, talk a little bit about that, if you might. About? Just about, <laughs> just about I mean, how do we have an honest discussion okay. about our community? I mean, I feel like we, we were, in the 80s and the 90s, it was, as, as Doc was saying, the leaders might have been saying two things, but now as we revisit our history, it seems like I'm hearing people say, nope, you guys were all lock them up, lock them up, lock them up. Now it seems like we're, when we're having these discussions, we don't really have that, that, that discussion about how do we as a, as a community have a, a real discussion about crime and safety and security and good policing and fairness and all those issues? So I think, again, going back to where a lot of this starts, it's about the mentality and I think the um, we have to deal with implicit bias that still exists in many, uh, amongst many, um, both in our community and outside of our community. Um, because it does start early. You do have uh, this, you know, um, this, this belief system that, again, that our children, uh, that we as a community are automatic criminal, criminals. And so that then evolves into how it is that we're perceived and how it is we're going to police our society. If we're, you know, black people as a whole can have a multiplicity of recommendations and thoughts. We are not, you know, monolithic, all right? <laughs> and we can be wrong. And let's just be fair <laughs> that uh, across the board, I think many, uh, you know, we, 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 I think many of us have been raised in, uh, in households where, uh, hey, you know, you, you live by the sword. I mean, you're, your parents, I, I, I remember the belt, and I remember a number of things that happened. Corporal punishment now, we recognize is not healthy. I'm not saying y'all don't still do it, but I'm just saying we know this, the data. We know actually how it results in the trauma in our children. But we cannot ignore the fact that at the same time we may have contributed to it, but we have evolved and we also recognize that we also have to be, uh, we have to be uh, responsive enough and responsible enough um, to engage in communication across the board. And so it takes two. It takes two sides, you know, it takes a, a, an effort both on our community, but also on the other, um, you know, for those who are policing. And so that's why I, I think that part of the conversation does have to be a joint effort across communities. Uh, we, within the educational sector, understanding why we have 3,000 districts that have a law enforcement professional in their schools, but yet don't have a school counselor. Mm -hmm. That dynamic is real. Then we need to also have, you know, the continued conversation with our police officers, the police unions, um, because it is, it's necessary to understand where is there a bias that is ingrained within uh, the law enforcement that is maybe working in our schools, um, that is not, and are they properly trained to be in our schools? Should they be in our schools? There's a number of questions that have to be raised. We need to have the conversation with our uh, elected officials. Are there laws that need to be changed in terms on the local and state uh, level, in terms of whether or not there's law enforcement in schools, what, how discipline codes, how they're assessed, who has the authority to engage, you know, what is the authority of the school board, do local laws need to be changed? All of this, everybody has to come together, and I do appreciate the fact that there was uh, the 21st uh, century, um, uh, the President's Commission, mm -hmm. uh, the Task Force on 21st President Century Obama. Policing, mm -hmm. that brought together many of us mm -hmm. in the community and provided a, a wealth of recommendations, some that I put to, you know, contributed to, testified on behalf of, and, and I think that has, that's part of the conversation. And again, I would just reiterate that before I leave, that it, we really do need to make sure that we're not ignoring what's the early, the early contributors <coughs> to this type of mentality and the bias that exists uh, that we are criminals. 
and it's starting in our schools. Mm -hmm. And we've got to deal with that fact right now because otherwise we are, we are, we are contributing by, ign by ignorance and neglect uh, to what is happening in our futures. Thank you. Ms. Swartz, um, Ms. Clay House talked about the schools. I want to talk to you too all about treatment as well. Right? I mean, a lot of the folks who are in prison are sick and need help and need treatment. What have you seen with regard to states and how they fund that, that part of the equation? We talked about education and how much money is spent on education versus prison, but what, what are some of the things maybe you've seen in that realm which as far as treatment and, and slashing of budgets and those issues? Sure. Well, before I answer, talk about, well, the answer is there's no treatment. It's the short answer. Right. Um, but I think I want to go back and talk, uh, sort of follow up with what Tanya was saying. You know, I have for my entire career represented, you know, people convicted and charged with crimes. Mm -hmm. For the last 20 years, I've re represented only people convicted of homicide so I, and condemned to death. So I have represented you know, the, the poster children for tough on crime. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that the answer to the question that you posed before is easy to find. It's in every case I've ever, ever handled. The story is the same over and over and over again. It is what Phil said. It's what Tanya said, right? This was set up from the beginning. Every client, without <coughs> exception, that I have represented came from you know, poverty, came from a failing school, came from a situation where there was abuse in the household that was not addressed, or to the extent that it was addressed, it was addressed by law enforcement. They came from a place where there was mental health problems that were unaddressed. They came from a place where there was addiction and violence in the household that was not treated. This is, and I mean this, without exception. I have represented, I don't know, 50, 100 people condemned to death, all of them. All of them, without exception, this is the story. Those human beings put into the other neighborhood that Phil talked about would have had an enormous panoply of services you know, available to them at all times. They would never, ever have wound up in the horrendous situation they wound up at one fine day when they wind up involved in a homicide. Why? Because there were 37 off-ramps available to them you know, throughout their life and throughout to get them out of these situations. Those off-ramps are literally not available to our clients, to our community, to our children. So when you have people who find themselves in like these terrible situations, right, you want social services to come in. You expect social services to come in, but they do not. I have clients, I, I could tell story after story, right? You know, education failures. I have a client who, you know, I want to say in first or second grade, literally the, 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 the you know, you remember the, Okay, the older of us will remember that you'd have the quarters and your teacher would write the notes in the quarter, you know, in the, in the box on the side. And it was literally, he's failing, he's failing, he's failing. And it was like, you know, if nothing is done, you know, this child is going to have problems. And nothing, nothing. You know, I see kids go to, you know, juvenile justice and then come home with recommendations. This child needs to have, you know, therapy. This child needs to have this. Nothing. There was no follow-up. Nothing happens. It is complete structural failure for each child that I have ever represented without exception. So where are the services? They are not in our communities. They are not available to our children. And when that happens, then it's, you know, and that's, not, that's happening because people don't care and because people expect our children, the people that look like us, to go to prison, right? So it, it is easy, you, like what Tanya said, right? Teachers look at black and brown young boys and they say, oh, well, that's where he's going anyway. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter, right? That's what they expect from those families. If you give those children the same opportunities that everybody else is accorded in those other neighborhoods that Phil talked about, you would not see the kind of homicides that, that I have, you know, unfortunately had to defend people against. They just wouldn't happen. The solution is there. We just choose not to, you know, to, to, to uh, implement it. Officer Cox, you talked about that. that and so when that young man is, is Ms. Warns has, has now represented that young man. When you, when you go back in history, at some point he ran across a police officer. And, at some, and, and as she said, the system had failed that young man even before he ran a, 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 a against that, a, across that police officer. How does a policeman, with, with the lack of those resources, how are you guys supposed to cope? One, I want, you to, I, want, I want to deal with that. I want you to answer that. And two, is it important that black people police be, see black police? Yes, definitely, and as the panelists who just left alluded to, President Obama created what was called the 21st Century on Policing. It was the latest and greatest document to uh, kind of restructure where we are today and where we should be going in the future. Unfortunately, this Justice Department has allowed us to uh, 
<laughs> remove it from my departments. And with anything, money is the key in my mind. So when you tie funding to mandates for operational procedures, I think you'll get a better outcome. When those things were removed, then agencies were allowed to go back to the practices that they, they uh, employed before. And when you got 18,000 police, uh, uh, police agencies across this state, 75% of them are 45 men or lower, you got a problem because most of those folks who are policing are policing for profit and various things like that. And I think you saw a over-policing, if you will, with the way police officers were evaluated. If you didn't go to work and write 20 tickets, you're considered a lazy guy. If you didn't go out here and find 20 brothers on the corner and at least lock up 10 or 15, so in that, we kind of lost our ability to build trust and legitimacy because we didn't have time to communicate. And in any relationship you have, no matter what you're doing, if you don't communicate, there's no relationship. And I so, and to get to where you're going, we have hurt ourselves in a lot of ways as people. She talked about the resources. There are not a lot of resources in our community, but unfortunately we have some folks in our community who have the resources who are exploiting each of us with those relationships. And I'll give you an example. I poll people all the time and I said, how many nonprofits are in the room? 15, 20 hands were raised. How many of you guys are working together? Very few. But there's so many people in our community that need the resources that are available, those few that are out there, that they never make it to folks like who she's talking about defending. So as a result of this, this is why we see the recidivation. This is why we're back and forth. You know, Johnny will never make it because he never <coughs> has a chance. He doesn't have a chance because we have failed him as a community. We've failed him as a criminal justice practitioner. And as a result of that, that's what we're seeing. And we're going to see more of it, especially under this Justice Department, because when you can go out and, 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 and pardon a guy named Joe Apparel, you give him a pardon. This guy has openly, in, in more than one case, endorsed racial profiling for brown and black people over and over again. You're endorsing that. And when the commander in chief, the president, says things like what he says, it gives those other guys an, an incentive. You know, if the boss is saying it's okay, then it's okay. You know, so where we saw a decline in racial profiling and, and traffic stops the way you used to see them, they're about to increase again because now technology has given us as law enforcement another tool. We, you see these things on the back of the trunks of police cars called tag readers. So if you want it and you're driving down the street, it's like fishing in a baited pond. Whether it's fair or not, I tell you that these are the kinds of things that we're gonna go through as a community until we demand better. And you can start with me, but I'm not the answer to your betterness. We're already on the same sheet. You need to start at the polls. You need to get out here and demand from your politicians. You know, not, let's not play hide, uh, run, hide and seek. They run for office, they hide from you, and then they seek your money to run again. <laughs> so I'm saying to you, it starts out there. All of this is local. You know, she's fighting at the Supreme Court with people who started probably on a local level. And they have been allowed to do these things for so long. They're going to continue it. So I can be here all day with this. this I'm back. Well, Mr. Scott, let me add, and I'm a former police officer. I'm not, I'm not trying to set you up. I want people to hear it, though, from, from the horse's mouth. Is it important for black people to become police officers? <coughs> it is. It is. That's the only way you're going to change. We met with... And, 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 and while well, you answer that... And when I see videos of some of the most horrific things lately, some of those police officers, we don't talk about it in our community, were black. Right, right. Baltimore, we had black people, black police officers who were committing some of those terrible. So, I, I, I'm, and again, I'm not trying to say you, but I want you to address, because I think that's something we as a community, we have to deal with. And, I, and I, I know what your answer, I think I know what your answer is going to be. But how in light of what we saw, where even some black police officers were doing some terrible, terrible, terrible things to black people, how do you, as a, as a representative of, of our nation's largest police organization of color, how do you get a young man or a young woman to say, I, I, you know what, you should consider being a, in a law enforcement? And why is that important? It's very funny. We had that same conversation with the Customs and Border Protection folks yesterday because a lot of our minority brothers and sisters are being walked out. They're being walked out 
before they can even apply a lot of times. Last week I got a, and I'm going to get to you, but yes, I'm, sir. Like Go I ahead. told you I'm Baptist. Um, I got a, a, a link from the FBI that sent out, they were doing this diversity hiring. Sent it out, and the first two or three people I sent it to sent it back to me and said, I automatically am disqualified because I didn't pay my student loans. I didn't feel that, fulfill that obligation. So, you know, there's all kinds of masks on diversity. You know, I'll tell you I'm going to make it diverse, but, you know, I'll put these stop gaps, if you will, out there to keep you. And then at the end of the day, when I'm showing my data, I can say, well, I tried. Mm -hmm. Well, getting back to what you're saying, millennials don't feel that what we do is important because of the trust in the uh, legitimacy piece. So as we work to try to build this trust in, in uh, legitimacy, we've got to depend on them to make, we've got to make this job attractive enough for them to join our ranks that they can make these changes. None of the federal agencies that I've visited with, and I've talked to most of the agency heads, have a secession plan for minorities to be in their leadership. You sit at the table and most of these federal agencies, their representative of the community doesn't look like who they serve. One of the recommendations in the 21st Century Task Force report was to make your community look like, the, to make your force look like the community that they serve. How can a guy that doesn't understand the people he's policing do a good job at that? And so that's why you're getting a lot of the, 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 the things that we're seeing. So yeah, it's very important. And, and I encourage all of you guys, go out there and put in applications or talk to somebody that looks like us so that our communities can look, I mean, our agencies can look like us and we can have a better service in our community. And I'd just like to, to piggyback on that, that theme there. It is important to have black people in every part of the criminal justice process. You will be shocked and amazed at how much discretion and power you have to influence the process. Right. It starts with law enforcement you'd be surprised how much discretion they have to decide to file a report on someone or to let someone go. You'll be shocked and surprised to know how much power, people, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a law professor. The students come to me and say, you know, I want to make a difference. I want to be a defense attorney. I think that's great. But you know, if you really want to make a difference, be a prosecutor. Yeah. Be a prosecutor, you know, because you <coughs> have so much power in the process in deciding someone's fate. And, and thankfully, the, the, the federal guidelines have been struck down from being mandatory, but they could do so much. They decide, the prosecutor can decide, oh, this person's a, um, a top-level top level dealer or someone at the top of the chart. I can offer that person immunity. I can go after low-level people if I want. I can go after low-level people to get the big person. They have that discretion. Uh, judges have that. Um, and then one thing, another thing I want, one thing I think about these things to leave with, you all have that discretion. Think about being a juror. Do you know what one juror does? Do you know the difference that one person of color does on a jury? Completely changes the conversation. Imagine, imagine a conversation of 12 people, everyone's a male. It's gonna be a certain conversation. 12 people, everyone's a female. It's gonna be a certain conversation. 12 people that are, that are all white, it's gonna be a certain conversation. You throw one person into the mix, you throw one African American in the mix, it's a whole different type of conversation. All right? And I'm not saying whether guilty or not guilty, but at least to be able to expose people. An example, running from police, you're guilty. Well, you know, depending on where you're from, that may be part of your culture, what you do. It doesn't mean you're guilty, you just run from police. That's what you were raised, that's how you, you expose people. So, um, grand juries as well. I mean, if you're looking, to, if, you, if you see this, why, why that person didn't get indicted, well, there's a number of reasons, but part of it, as African Americans, we have to be engaged. That, that grand jury notice comes to you, or that jury notices, respond, go to jury duty. Now granted, there's, they'll try to, you know, they, they use sometimes peremptory challenges, knock people out because of race and they shouldn't, but nonetheless, you can make a difference in the process. And, and just to, to expose people to a different conversation, to enlighten them, because a lot of times people just aren't aware. But I think I want you to you know that you have, you have, there's some power in this, and, and don't, and I think it was mentioned, sh show up. All right, show up, show up when they, in the jury, think about being a prosecutor, think about being a criminal defense uh, uh, attorney, law enforcement judge, but engage in the process, all right? Don't wait till the process already occurred and you say, well, why did that person get acquitted? Or, or why isn't that person arrested? No, get in the front and this, that's your right, yeah. all right? Be aware that you're constant, you're right, take advantage, get engaged. I'm glad you brought up the juries. I'm gonna come to Ms. Warren's in a little bit because I wanna hear the process from your side, but before I do that, 
Dr. Goff, talk to me about research you might have about the importance of, of the policing looking like the community, because I, I want, Mr. if you could piggyback on what Mr. Cox talked about a little bit. Yeah, so it's a good question. It's a complicated answer. Um, the first thing is, um, if you feel like law enforcement does not reflect your values, that hurts a whole heck of a lot more if they also don't reflect your community demographics. Right? There's a difference between law enforcement that works as part of the community, those Peelian principles, the public are the police, and the police are the public, right? and law enforcement that's an occupying force. Right. Right? And when they all look different than the folks in a community, that feels a whole heck of a lot like an occupying force. So it's hard to have legitimacy in a community where you don't end up looking like them. That said, when you diversify a police department, that's not sufficient to make the police department act right. So across the country, um, if you count diversity as just number of people in, what you're going to end up with is more diverse at patrol than you've got in command staff. Mm -hmm. I know you know something about that. Um, <clears throat> and as a result, you end up with folks who are not the decision makers. They're just out there executing the decisions. Right? No less bias in those situations. Because black officers, in the situation is so powerful, they end up uh, behaving very much like all the other officers. To their best of their ability, the best of their character they got, all the other officers. So if we're going to insist on diversity, we got to have a, de the, a distinction between what Miguel Azueta refers to as horizontal diversity, which just means counting, <laughs> and vertical diversity. That means diversity of the decision makers. Because once you diversify the decision makers, you start to see a difference. It's the same in schools, by the way, where you have the biases of the principals influence the, dis the uh, disciplinary rates of the kids. Same thing. It's the biases of that chief or that sheriff going to influence how everybody is, is held accountable. So it matters, but it's a little bit more complicated. Now you mentioned that the responsibility for fixing all that, that lies in the communities. I'll say yeah, but I'll also say there's a new partner that we've got that I think that, that black folks should get excited about. Because there's no reason for us to be excited about them for any other, other reason other than the fact that it's cool to play around online. The partners are Silicon Valley. Now Silicon Valley does not look like us at all. They don't have the same values as we do, right? Silicon Valley is not an obvious friend. But here's the deal. Silicon Valley got a lot of money and they don't know what to do with it, okay? And part of, of what they're trying to do is they're trying to make meaning of their lives. I made all this money, what the heck am I gonna do? Do I buy a third yacht or do I fix racism? And more and more, they're thinking they wanna start fixing racism. They're investing in nonprofits. They're investing in civil rights because they understand that that's part of the unfinished promise of America. So if we're gonna talk about solutions, I just want us to, to start thinking about something that hasn't come up yet. Silicon Valley is investing in criminal justice reform, and we need to get ahead of that, because we can start steering it. The project that we're doing, the National Justice Database, has support from Google. And what we're now gonna be able to do, a year from now, at next year's CBC uh, uh, <clears throat> ALC, I'm gonna be able to announce, we've got a product that automatically collects the data from law enforcement, standardizes and cleans it, does the analyses, and then translates it back to English language. Let me put that in a little more concrete terms. We are the best at what we do. I have the best team in the world. 30 PhD folks who are National Academy of Science uh, uh, members. Like the, we, These are some really professional nerd people. It takes us nine to 12 months to write a report for every single police department that we write for. At the end of this process, with Google's help, it'll take nine to 12 minutes. There will be no police department in the world, forget about the United States, in the world that will have an excuse for not understanding the role of bias in their own behavior. That's something that communities can start uh, organizing around. That's something that we can get our states to buy into. That's something that we can get our, our cities to buy into. Right? And as of right now, it won't be forever, but as of right now, it's co come for the low, low cost of free 99. Right? So because researchers, I'm terrible at making money. Y'all saw me last year at ALC, I was wearing the same suit. Okay. That's not what we do. We don't make money for a living. We make justice for a living. So my goal in trying to, to communicate all this to you is not just to talk about how the diversity of the force matters. It, the vision we've got for the path we take to a better tomorrow, that's going to matter too. And Silicon Valley hasn't articulated a vision. They just got a lot of ambition mm -hmm. in doing it. So if we start reaching out now and start sh shaping that story the right kind of way, we're going to have a wave of support to finally start getting done some of the things that without that kind of money, our communities are going to take generations to get to. I'm glad you brought that up about Silicon Valley. I know we at the Urban League would love to have some engagement with Silicon Valley, and heretofore have, have, not, have been unable to do so in many, many ways. And so you're right, Doc. I think they're finally starting to turn the corner, but I'd love, as Senior Vice President of Policy, I'd love to hear from them a little bit more often. We've got some great programs we'd love to talk to them about that we've been running for 100, 100 years. Ms. Warns, 
How important is it that people of color are involved in the system? I know you're on the defense side. Usually you're representing the, 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 the alleged criminal. Um, how important is it to have, have blacks on the prosecution side and on the defense side and throughout the process? What have you seen? So, I mean, obviously it's very important for all of the reasons that you know. You have to have people of color who have, um, who can relate to clients, who know the experience, who can communicate that. But what Phil said is, of course, 100% right as well, right? That it's hard to make that experience have traction if you have no power in the organization. And that's on both sides of the aisle, right? The public defender, I don't have to tell you all, the public defender's office is largely overwhelmingly white. Um, and it is not a place where our voices are predominantly heard, right? I run a public defender's office, but that is rare to be charitable, to be a black woman or a black person running a public defender office is very unusual in this country. And listening to what everyone said reminded me of a phrase that a law professor of mine once said, it's easier for institutions to change individuals than it is for individuals to change institutions, right? And that is the problem. Right? Yes, black people should go into the institutions, but black people wind up leaving because what happens is you go to the prosecutor's office, you go to the, to the police department, you go to corrections, you go to the public defender's office right, with these wonderful visions of being able to do the justice, right, to, to share the stories, to get your organization to see the world in the way that we see it. Um, and what you find is racism, right? a big bad wall of racism. So, I mean, this is a long, you know, fight. Yes, we have to be there, but when you go, you have to be prepared to stand up and speak out. You know, it's not going to be a place that is receptive automatically to your vision, even though these are places that are supposed to be dedicated to justice and to equality and to anti-racism. That's not the reality in the not-for-profit not world oftentimes. So if you go, you have to go ready. Um, to really stand your ground, um, because that is what it will take. Um, I was going to also add, in terms of the, the wall of racism that you know we face when we go into the criminal justice system, I think one of the more, I've had over the years conversations with law enforcement, so one of the more powerful examples of that that I have heard, and let me know if this is wrong, um, is that law, black law enforcement, like to speak out, is literally risking your life literally risking your life to speak out, to say, you know, you wonder to yourself, you know, how can these black officers watch the beatdowns, right? I get, the, I get you on the flip side, you're in the pen, and then you come through, and obviously, there has been a beatdown. Um, and then you wonder, right, how are these officers standing by and allowing, you know, people to be beat down like this in the street? And the answer to that question is, because if I say something, they won't come. If I, black law enforcement officer, speak up when I see one of the white officers beating someone down on the street, when I put out a radio call for backup, they will not come. So that's how deep, I just need us to understand like how deep this is, right? It's not like, it's not small, it's not minor, but we are asking, you know, my, my, my brother over here and, and, the, and the black law enforcement officers to do is literally put their own lives and their careers at risk. That is the depth of um, sort of racism and structural racism that is ingrained in the institutions in which the, everyone on this stage is working in. So when Phil says we need change from the top down, it is the understatement of the year. Um, because that, when, you know, when I heard that, there's a, you know, a few things, Phil has another one which we won't talk about now, uh, that, that like left me speechless and breathless. You know, when you think about that, right, I'm gonna leave you out there and you can get shot. Why? Because you turned, you said something about me doing something wrong. That's crazy, but that's the truth. So we all agree that these things here and social media have changed the way we've been able to see some of the things that have always existed in our communities, but now we are seeing them and we're seeing them real time on our televisions because someone has become a citizen journalist and they're able to report this. I, that's how I was raised, that's, that's my experience. Now, if I shared that with some of my um, professors at, at the University of Dayton, they would laugh at me. Mm -hmm. They said, no, it's gonna happen. It's, no, that's, that's, I take my experience with law enforcement throughout my life, I take it with me, it doesn't leave. You know, another reason, at my school, I'm one of the few professors who wears a suit every day, because if I don't, I may be treated differently. That's why I wear a suit, because I know I'll be treated a certain way if I wear a suit. But, you know, some of the other professors who, who aren't African American, they can, you know, look, you know, kind of wear anything, and they're probably gonna be treated the same way. But I know as African, I, I'm not. 
And so our, I, could, I could tell that experience to people individually, all right, but it takes a while. What social media has done, it has allowed uh, us to share our experiences with the world. Because before, imagine, imagine if you would, what do you think the Philando Castile police report would have said? What do you think that police, that, that, that police report would have said? What would have, it would have said? They would have had lines in there, stop resisting, stop resisting, stop resisting, keep your hands so I can see. But what does it do? One thing that's not, and again, I'm not trying to, I think 95% of all law enforcement do a great job. But like any profession, any lawyers, professors, there's some bad apples, all right? What it has shown, though, it allows us, social media allows us to share our experience with non-African Americans who, who, who they sometimes, which I've seen, have the luxury of actually arguing with police and debating. Um, debate, it blew my mind to watch someone on video. This woman was debating, uh, just disagreeing with the officer, non-compliant, and nothing happened. That's her experience. All right? She's also Caucasian. That's her experience with law enforcement. So one thing that I really like about social media, it democratizes um, the sharing of information. So it allows people uh, to see what is our experience. And, and I think we, uh, someone mentioned this earlier about um, having an honest conversation. But well, one thing it also allows people to do is it's, it's a communication tool. So you, know, you have this thing now with black Twitter. It allows us to better share our experiences with one another and also to talk about our experiences with one another and to see that many of us are going through many similar problems. So I think it, 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 can, be, it can be a very useful tool for us, social media. Mr. Cox, what do you think? I'm kind of in the middle of the road on this one um, for several reasons. And the one reason is that in a way I think it has made us lazy in our ability to communicate. I'm, I'm certainly old school when it comes to having a conversation, looking you in your eye and, and, and talking to you. And I think for that very reason, in a lot of our communities, we don't support each other because we don't know each other. I mean, most of us, I've polled people, and if they're honest, I said, how many of you guys know your neighbor? Most of them don't because, you know, they drive down the road, hit the garage door open, they get the mail, and they go right into the house, and then they text the kids, come down, let's eat. You know, but they don't have these conversations, how was your day, and that kind of thing. So in that respect, I'm a little bit, you know, against it. But if Martin Luther King had had Twitter, I don't know where we'd be. I think we'd be a lot further along because the ability for Black Lives Matter and whoever that wants to have a protest to get hundreds of thousands of people gathered in the moments Sometimes it's a great thing, you know, so I'm just kind of in the middle of it. But I, I do think when used properly in the right space, I think it's a great tool. We just need to take advantage of the advantages. You know, I laid in the floor and read the encyclopedias when I was a kid, but now you've got it right there on the hip. You don't have to have encyclopedias. And there's a whole lot of knowledge in this. And I think if, if our young folk would look at the history of the civil rights and understand that a little bit better, they are our voice now. And I think they could do a lot more than Martin and Jesse and some of the other folks that came before them if they do it right. It's all about the application. So that's where I'm <laughs> but at. But what do you think about it when it's used to show some of the things we've seen? Do you think, as an officer, is it, is, is it, has it been helpful? Has it been Very hurtful? helpful. Okay. It's very helpful because, as I told you, these things did not just start happening. Mm -hmm. They are just being captured now. And I think that has helped me to help us as a community and to help my profession because, as she just alluded to, it's a bad day when you go down to IA, Internal Affairs Bureau, and you say, hey, you know, I know that Joe tuned this guy up, and that's what we call it. And, you know, Joe wrote in his report, he was driving down the street, and then all of a sudden the light turned red, and he slammed on brakes, so the guy hit the cage, and his face is all bruised up, knowing that Joe was tuned up. Well, that same guy, because he didn't have the advantages of body cameras or social media, when he puts in a help call tomorrow in a bad neighborhood, nobody's coming. You know, you're going to hear the microphones click, and you're going to hear sirens and sirens. I've had that happen to me, and that's not a good feeling when you're out there getting your butt kicked, and you hear these sirens, and they're going in another direction. Mm -hmm. So, 
Or God, what do you think about social media and the impact it's had on, on our justice system or policing? Well, I mean, I, I think, oh, I should use a mic. Um, <clears throat> I think it depends on how you want to use it. So if you use it as a substitute for human contact, that's, it's in the way. If you use it as facilitating for human contact, it's tremendous. When you democratize, democratize the sharing of information, then you catalyze social change. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I think that's uncomfortable for folks of, of my generation and anybody older than that, um, it, what it's doing is it's, it's making us less relevant for the defining of our narratives, right? Younger folks are saying, yeah, no, that's great, that's old, right? And that's not just because I'm feeling old today, that's because younger people are resisting the ways in which we're giving them language to talk about this stuff. And oftentimes that can, that can feel uncomfortable, but that's good. Because remember when we were the young ones and, we did, and the, our music was too loud and they didn't understand? And the, it's happening to us just faster. And they're sharing language about it. So they're more articulate about it. So I'm really impressed with this generation of folks. Um, you know, like we, 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 I don't know how many hot takes have been written today on what millennials are ruining, right? Um, but at least three since we sat down here, right? Um, <clears throat> But I'm really impressed with the ability to mm -hmm. construct a language that's more responsive to the way that we're doing race now than any that the folks who know what we're doing could have done. My hope is that we, are, we learn to use social media and technology to build intergenerational bridges so that we've got the folks who understand how institutions work with the folks who are developing the language for right now. That's, I think, the, the part uh, that's been missing, and that's on us. We gotta learn how to move from Twitter to Slack. We got to move from email, from, from Facebook to Twitter, right? Some of us got to move from MySpace to Facebook. <laughs> um, uh, but we we got to be the ones who end up doing that moving. We need to meet young people where they are. Agreed. Because young people are, like, very, very soon, they are in charge. It's, right. it's, it's a blink, and they're where we are. Right. Um, uh, so I'm excited about the way that social media is influencing social change and making it a truly intergenerational thing so that the legacy organizations don't end up having folks locked out. And the legacy organizations have to evolve at the same pace that our communities are evolving. Absolutely. Ms. Warrens, what about you? What do you think about social media and how it's affected and, and, and these cell phones and videos? How is it affecting the justice system from your view? Well, I mean, from my viewpoint, I think, you know, I have the experience of being old and being a dinosaur and having, you know, <laughs> been in the well of courtrooms saying over and over and over and over and over again, my client was beat up, my client was this, whatever happened, and, you know, to, 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 radi to crickets. Um, so for me, are you kidding? The videos are you know, uh, shining a light, right, on the stuff that has been going on throughout history in the criminal justice system, right? It's, it's, it's I don't want to say it's undisputable because see, see, see cases, mm -hmm. but, you know, the videos really do give credibility to the lived experience of thousands and thousands and thousands of people in this country. Um, and it validates, right? It's a validating thing for people who live in those communities to have that you know, around and, you know, sort of visible to everyone to say, like, this is the reality of what happens in my community. And we did not have that before, right? We did not have that before. And so that changes the narrative that changes for me when I walk into a courtroom, you know, when I start arguing about what happened on the street, there was a different dynamic. When I stood in the United States Supreme Court and talked about why it was wrong and why it was unconstitutional that I represented a man on death row whose own lawyer introduced evidence that said he was more likely to commit crimes in the future because he was black. Wow. And I, could, and I stood for five days after Charlotte exploded. The Supreme Court knew it was why it mattered, right? Because there was a video of what had happened in Charlotte, and that was black equals dangerous as much as my client's case was black equals dangerous. So there was real synergy, and it made my case more important in a way that I think it wouldn't have been had those videos not been circulating for the past five years. I will say that the caveat to that is, I think we also need to understand that tweeting is not organizing, right? It is bringing people out, but that is not organizing, right? And so that there's two different things. Um, to tweet is not to organize, to tweet is to tweet. Um, so, it, you know, there's a different, there's a second step, right? To engage and to meaningfully organize, to change structures. Um, in real ways, you have to do more than tweet. Um, and so you have to go further. That's like a vehicle to provide people with information, but then we do have to take it the second step to do real organizing and community building and power building. Um, and it's not going to come on a Twitter or a social media platform. Before our panelists continue, I, I do want to take a, point, a moment of personal privilege. I told you when we started this panel that this was going to be a panel unlike any other. We have been joined by a very special guest who wants to speak on this issue. This issue is, is, is not a, a, a new one to uh, the House Minority Whip. He has been a friend of our community. 
for decades and has been a public servant, a leader in the United States Congress, a leader in the great state of Maryland. And so ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm so honored to ask to come up and speak to us um, for, for some brief words on this issue, hopefully, and, and on some other things that are important that are going on in our country. But I want you to please join me in welcoming the House Minority Whip from Maryland's 5th District, Mr. Steny Hoyer. really hurt me. We old people thinking about all of us. I, 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 got, I, got, I got like 10 years on you. <laughs> but, but I agree with you. You understand. Uh, but I'm thinking to myself, all this stuff, I don't understand it. But I'm on all of these media. <laughs> all of them. The good news is I have a lot of young people who do it for me. Uh, otherwise, I'd be uh, non-communicative in this new world in which we live. But I am pleased to be here with all of you. I'm sorry that I didn't hear all the panelists uh, uh, I heard these two, on the, on, but I didn't get to t hear the two of you. Uh, this is a critically important issue. Uh, peace and good order is as of much interest uh, in the minority communities as it is in any community in America. And minority communities are most at risk by the lack a peace and order. And peace and order will exist only if we have a trust relationship between the enforcer and the enforcees, the community. I'm a big supporter of community policing because the communities need to get to know and have faith and trust in those who are keeping peace and good order. Uh, and it is necessary for us at the federal level to make sure there is accountability. And Lacey Clay has been sure that we continue to focus on that as the representative of Ferguson, but there are so many other communities. I come from Prince George's County, Maryland. I grew up in Prince George's County, went to high school, public high school in Prince George's County. And I grew up during an era where we went from about 9% African American now to where we are a majority African American community. And for some of you who don't know anything about Prince George County, you will like this fact. As we became increasingly a minority community, the education level in Prince George County went up. Wow. Hear me, it went up. Uh, we're one of the most affluent minority communities in America. Uh, and we are a community who went through the largest busing uh, order in 1973. I saw people very angry, luckily, there was, I won't say there was no violence, because there was some rocks thrown there, but nobody was injured. And it took understanding one another. And there's a lot of racism in Prince George's County. Raise your hand if there's no racism in your community. Uh, we saw it in Charlottesville, manifested in one of its worst forms in this country people uh, who were celebrating racism uh, and uh, uh, the principles of Nazism and nationalism and I'm better than you are because of the color of my skin or the religion uh, or frankly gender. Uh, this is a critically important issue uh, because if we don't understand one another, uh, we are going to uh, fail together. That's what Lincoln said, you know. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And a community, this is why this issue is so critically important and why we need to have police forces raise their consciousness, their understanding of what they say and what they do and the impact it has on those uh, with whom they need to work to keep the peace. And very frankly, all of us know there are some people, white and black, no matter how much understanding there is, there's going to be confrontation. It's not a color thing. It's human beings. Uh, but we also know that if we do not have a constructive relationship between the public and those they have hired who work for them, uh, that doesn't mean they ought to wink and nod and blink because, you know, it's somebody in the public because we need peace and good order. We need law and order. Unfortunately, law and order was used as a racist term when I was growing up. 
it was a euphemism for keeping blacks in their place. Hear an amen out there? That's what I heard. I thought it was an mm, mm, but I, you know, I took it as an amen. Uh, so I, I thank you for being here. This is the best legislative conference that is held in, in Washington, D.C. every year, bar none. The experts that are brought here who are uh, teaching us how to respond in a more positive way, whether it's education, whether it's health care, and by the way, the next 24, 48, 96 hours, 180 hours are going to be critically important. Mm -hmm. And if we don't raise our voices and be engaged over the next uh, uh, few hours, next seven days, millions of people may lose their health insurance. And that will not be good for our society. So I would urge all of you, as we focus on this issue, critically important, that the immediate challenge to us is uh, people are trying to uphold states' rights by taking people's protections away from them. Mm -hmm. Sound familiar? Yeah. Uh-huh. I grew up in the 50s. I was in high school in the 50s and college in the 60s. So I heard a lot about states' rights. It was a euphemism for not treating people the way they ought to be treated, segregating our societies. Not one nation indivisible, but one nation divided. So I'm pleased to be here. I'm pleased to be here with my friend Lacey Clay. I served with his dad. That's how old I am. <laughs> this is my 50th year in a public office. You know. <laughs> you know the guy that led those claps was talking about how young people had taken over. What are we doing with this old guy? Get rid of him. Get it. Time for him to get off the stage. Uh, I understand it, but I want, I want to say I served with Lacey, uh, Lacey's dad. What a wonderful member of Congress uh, he was. What a giant he was in so many different areas. Now, I represent a lot of, a lot of federal employees. I'm from Prince George County, just southern Maryland. I represent 62,000 federal employees. Lacey's dad was a giant in protecting and promoting uh, the, the work uh, and pay and benefits of federal employees. Uh, you tell your dad I said that, Lacey, and thank you for all that you do uh, to uh, uh, make the Congress and make your district in Missouri uh, so well represented. You do a great job. Thank you very much. God bless all of you. Thank you, Congressman. One more round of applause for Congressman Hoyer, and thank you for your leadership. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I know you guys have tight schedules, and so we're not going to try to go too long. Instead of question and answer, because you can maybe talk to the, the lady and the gentleman on the way out, what I'd like them to do, because they've had so much information to share, I'd like to give each one of them a one and a half, maybe a minute closing. And, they, and, and maybe talk about some of the things you didn't get a chance to talk about. And then after it's over, if they can stay for a little longer and you can have questions and you want to exchange business cards with them, they can do so. But I'm going to start with you, Professor Hoffmeister. Okay, I would just reiterate uh, what Congressman Hoyer says. As you know, we, we live in some very challenging times right now. And I, I, I think it is key. First, I'm happy everyone came here. I, I love the interest in these issues. But I just want to encourage you to be proactive and not reactive. And when I, and when I say uh, proactive, I, I want to use a term that I heard here on the panel, show up. And there's a lot of different ways you can show up. You can, you can, um, you can try to get involved with law enforcement, uh, uh, look at the prosecutor's office, a judge. But I think one of the key things that almost each and every one of us can do, when we get that jury notice, Respond to that notice. When we get that grand jury notice, even though it's inconvenient and it makes life more challenging and difficult, you can make a difference at the smallest level. <clears throat> if you see some um, a law enforcement official doing something wrong or a public official, hold them accountable. All right? Uh, almost every um, prosecutor that I'm aware of at the state level, except maybe one state, they're elected officials. Let the, him or her know what are your interests. What do you want that prosecutor going after? What, do you want them uh, evaluated based on how many criminal convictions they obtain? Or do you want them evaluated based on whether or not they do justice? All right? But make your voice known. You'll be amazed how much power you really have. 
All right, so if I can leave with any parting comments, it would be to be proactive and to show up. Thank you, Professor Hoffmeister. Mr. Cox. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, Congressman, for this opportunity. I feel like a bobblehead dog because all these folks up here are saying things that I agree with, so I've just been sitting there going. But any, anyhow, I ask that if you have any uh, thoughts of protesting, visit our website, um, <coughs> noble.org. It'll give you some parameters and gives you some things that law enforcement expects from you as a protester and things you should expect from law enforcement. We have an obligation to protect you, just like we do anybody who counter protests, whatever your issue is. So I ask that you do that. And then we have noble chapters across the country, and we're going out across this country teaching young folk how to engage with police officers so that you will arrive home safely. And unfortunately, it's, it's a bad time to have to make an announcement like this, but we actually tell you that you're not going to win. You're not going to hold court on the side of the road and come out victorious. So there are ways in, in, that we suggest that you have a successful uh, encounter with law enforcement. So I encourage you to reach out to noble chapters across the country, wherever you live, your home, and ask them to present that program in your community so that the folk in your, the young folk especially in your community will know how to engage and encounter with law enforcement if you have that opportunity. Thank you for uh, this opportunity again. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Dr. Goff. So again, thank you, Congressman. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for being here um, through the session. I hope we kept you uh, awake and lively. Um, if I've got one message, um, it's that if you, are, if you don't care enough to measure something, then you're comfortable lying about it. Hmm. Um, in law enforcement in particular, but also as we, we measure incarceration, we don't measure things in ways that allow us to know anything about it. And there's two areas where that matters a lot to me um, that I want to have as a, sort of my, my dismount on this. One, the myth that the, the real reason for all of this is black on black crime, <laughs> right? Because uh, folks are trying to tell a lie that the reason for all the suffering of black people are the choices of black people, right? You've been hearing that it was black people sold black people into slavery, right? Black people choose to, to not get, get an education. They sag the pants. They don't want to live a respectable life. Black people are not going in the middle of the street trying to say, yes, please, I want to be gunned down. Black people are not choosing underfunded schools. Black people are not disinvesting in community health. These disparities are not... So the lie is possible because we have not cared enough to measure, okay? And the cautionary tale is this. We gotta measure in exactly the right way all of our values. We talked a little bit about social media. I wanna make sure that we get, we, we get a, a word in on body cameras. Body cameras are great. Body cameras are wonderful. They're gonna hold, hold law enforcement accountable. But they only see what we allow them to see. I wanna point out one thing. Body cameras are turned off when someone is incarcerated, when someone's doing undercover work, right? when someone's responding to domestic violence. Who is most likely to be abused in those situations? Women. Body cameras make visible the suffering of black and brown men, and if we focus too much on them, we risk the, the visibility of that, making black and brown women invisible. So I want us to be measuring a lot Okay? I want us to be measuring more. I'm a professional nerd. And there's no way that we can ask to, to hold people accountable to the lies they tell if we don't give them the light to shine and say, this is the truth of things. Okay? <clears throat> but if we're going to try and tell the truth by measuring things, let's make sure that our values are aligned with the things that we're trying to measure. Thank you, Doc. Excellent. Last but not least, Ms. Swarn. Last but not least. Um, you know, the thing I want us to, but the last thing I want to say and the thing I want to leave you with is you know, and it has been mentioned um, at the beginning of this panel that, you know, there was a time when there wasn't so much attention focused on the crisis of criminal justice. There was a time when there wasn't so much, you know, uh, concern about African American men in the criminal justice system. I want us to realize that and realize sort of the error of that way. My organization that I used to work for, LDF, right, the mainstream civil <coughs> rights organizations were not um, always leading the charge you know, um, yours too, right. right? We're not always leading the charge around issues of, of race and criminal justice. And that was a shame. Right. And that is something we will all have to reckon with, right, at the end of the day. What I want us to do is, is learn from that history and not allow this to be a fad and not allow this to be a moment in time, right? This is a, this is a crisis that will not change 
unless there was a sustained, <coughs> ongoing commitment to justice in the criminal justice system. It's not going to change. Next year, Phil will tell you this, it, when his, when his uh, fancy thing comes out, I don't even know what the words are for that. <laughs> it's not going to change immediately when that comes out. It is going to require years of sustained attention and focus and fight from all of us. So I encourage you not to walk away when the cameras go someplace else, and they will. Uh, but to remember what you have seen and what you have learned about the, the inner workings of the criminal justice system from those, from those cameras. And remember, that is going to go on no matter what, unless we stay here and we show up and we continue to fight for justice for everyone that goes through the criminal justice system. Make a great point, Ms. Swarns. I tell you, at the National Urban League, and I, and I say this to our affiliates, I say this especially to our young people, Dr. Goff, you said it, our young people won't let us forget. That's one of the great benefits that the millennial generation is bringing. They're not going to put up with this. And if we, as historical civil rights organizations, like the National Urban League, like the NAACP, if we don't take note, they will just move past us and we will become irrelevant. Yep. And we have an obligation, if we want it to continue, not to let that happen. So I want to thank each and every one of the panelists. Let's give them a round of applause, please. Before you leave, I just want you to know that the Congressional Black Caucus has been ever vigilant on these issues. This is not the first time the Congressional Black Caucus has talked about this. In your package, you will see a list of legislation that has been filed by the Congressional Black Caucus. I'm proud to say that many pieces of this legislation we support at the National Urban League. So find located uh, also the tables, a snapshot. You find this in your packet, which lists the bills introduced by members of the CBC. Also, call your member of Congress. Call your member of Congress and talk to them about these pieces of legislation. Are they on this legislation? Have they co-sponsored it? I gave a session yesterday about co-signing. We love co-signing in the black neighborhood, right? If you co-sign something, <laughs> typically it means you got a point, right? Maybe there's something right about it. Get your member to co-sign, literally co-sign some of these pieces of legislation. And then last but not least, I got to thank the congressman and his lovely wife, because he couldn't do all this without her. I want to thank Congressman Clay for hosting this wonderful issue for him. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Congressman. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great rest of the ALC, and God bless each and every one of you.